It began about 10 years ago, Marty, when I began to, to see the differences that uh, technology was making and the talk about the internet that was coming and the way libraries were getting rid of um, uh, paper catalogs and, and moving to computers. And I, and I could see that big changes were taking place in society and it occurred to me that since technology related to information, there may be more dramatic changes taking place with libraries than with most other uh, agencies as we know them. Many years ago, librarians um, were talking about the need just to get people to come to their libraries because the new services they were offering, um, the opportunities to use computers were not generally known by everybody. So there was talk that a library had to be a compelling place. It had to not just be uh, sheltered to protect books or keep the rain away from people. Mm -hmm. It had to be a place that was important, fun to visit. made it an objective that we are marketing library services through design, okay. through the building itself, and through other aspects, which is one of the reasons we asked um, Michael to be involved. And one of the conditions that I really enjoy is um, this interactivity. Mm -hmm. And the interactivity be uh, with my work isn't just with the people in its immediate environment, or only people, but also the interactivity of the sculpture within the architecture itself.
creation that Michael and I came up with. It's, it's, it's perhaps the world's largest floor lamp. This, um, we're calling it the electrolier, which is probably a term dating back to the turn of the century for lamps. Mm -hmm. But few lamps have ever been 46 feet in diameter. But the scale of the room is so great that we practically can afford to create architecture within architecture. So we have a canopy 46 feet in diameter that is over the opening in the floor and over the lounge seating around the opening in the floor. And then there's a feeling like being under a great umbrella, but the umbrella is largely translucent with uh, the acrylic panes with Michael Hayden's uh, magic film on it, so that these panes are both transparent and iridescent. It contains three levels, the lowest level, the main level, an upstairs reading room with a very high ceiling. But each of those levels has an opening or an aperture in the mm -hmm. floor mm -hmm. so that on any level you can look up or down and see other library services. It was a way to bring a vertical uh, community together. Uh, with the using of the different technologies that I uh, uh, utilize in my work, uh, in my sculptural work, my standalone sculptures, and putting it right into the fabric of the building itself, then the building itself takes on these different personas. Uh, they change daily, from nighttime to daytime. They have a different way of being seen, way of looking. Mm -hmm. And seasonally, whether it's an overcast sky in, of the winter months mm -hmm. or it's sunny and bright in the, in the summer months, the glazing system uh, of these two buildings each have different articulated holograms. And that, the articulation is the pattern that, that you see on this small sculpture. But they, they go right into the glazing system of the building. Mm -hmm. So that when the sun strikes this glazing system, it throws spectra into the interior of the building. So you have rainbows that splash there on the walls. Mm -hmm. And what David and his staff did is design the walls to accept this in full anticipation. It's been working with us from the very earliest stages of design. And we think that makes a difference when it comes to integrating art and architecture. People from the uh, library um, were involved as we generated initial ideas to tell us which ones they thought they would most like to see develop further. It's part of our approach to participation and collaboration with a client. These sculptures, or this integration, um, are, is specific to these buildings. Okay. And so we, David, on a, a number of occasions, he and his staff, challenged me to come up with brand new thinking that would be applicable to solving problems that I had never encountered before. It used to be that the architect orchestrated uh, all of these other artisans and craftsmen mm -hmm. in hopes for a, a, a total composition mm -hmm. for everything the eye would see. And mm -hmm. we're trying to have a return to that. We didn't choose interior colors or carpet or fabrics until we knew what to expect. Um, okay. From uh, Michael's participation. Okay. This window is approximately 100 years old in the late 1800s. I want you to notice all the different textures. We have opalescent glass, which is this, and cathedral glass, which has heavy textures. The glass is primarily all Kokomo opalescent glass from Kokomo, Indiana. They've been making glass since 1883 and helped out Tiffany and Lafarge, they were collaborators and everything at that particular time. The, what's very unusual about this window is that it's 10 feet by 5 feet. Uh, the opalescent glass is, you can see how, the opalescent glass is exceptional. I can tell how old it is, of course, by the texture, Ooh, years, <laughs> um, by the texture that has been used on the glass. Kokomo has changed their textures throughout the years, so when you see glass, you can tell how old it is. And this is the very first original uh, texture without any granite on this border, and we call that cat spawn. Uh, they also use jewels here, faceted jewels, and those are all hand faceted, which is really nice. Um, the tough part is matching the consistency of texture and the wispiness or the mixture of cathedral and opal in the opal glass. They can get these textures because they have the Kokomo Opalescent Glass Company has re brought back their texture rollers so they can match all of these glasses, all their particular textures. What they're trying to do is to suspend the weight from the top to this plate 
So all this weight rests on here, and then the next section, and then the next section. And what has happened, of course, is all the weight is going past this bar, and this bar, this one's off, that one's on, that one's on. But as it starts to, the weight starts to work its way down to the plate, and that's what you don't want, because that's when you start really getting the bad bowing. Uh, exotic glasses. This is, a real, if you look at this color, it's, been, it's iridized almost. So you can see an iridescent quality to this. And it's kind of a kind of an orange when you get the light through it, but when you view it this way, it's a purple. It's a very unusual wispy opal. You have a crack right here, right where the reinforcement is. That's because the weight's coming down and it wants to move. Something has to go. There's no lead line there, so the glass broke. That is an awfully large panel to be putting in such uh, putting in this design with such small panels. It has to go somewhere. You can see that it bowls right on the main line of your design. It's like a hinge with every wedge joint. It should be all cleaned up, re-soldered where the joints are broken. The uh, glazing will be loosened up with a solution and then re-glazed, all clean, all socked, all re -lit. But there are a couple of other principles that are that are important. And one is uh, to try to create a building with a sense of place, mm -hmm. a comfortable place, so that you can sit down and want to stay a while. And we also organized it as a journey. This is another of the principles of architecture that is usually fun. And so we talked to Michael about some sculptural elements in the courtyard, which might be seen from various places around the building. A simple small piece that's going to go into the courtyard and uh, it's 12 points of the clock and the the bending component is that the same modulus is bent 12 different ways every one of these elements has diffraction components the challenge here was to increase an 80,000 square foot building um, to 100,000 square feet, and then all of the other things that we normally try to bring to a project anyway, including the excitement of people wanting to visit and wanting to stay and a sense of place. But we also wanted the form or shape of the existing building to still read through. You can't um, get a fine building unless you've got a client who supports a, fi a fine building, or you can't do it without a fine client. Mm -hmm. And we've been working with Kalamazoo staff for four years, and by the time we finish that building, it'll be another year and a half. And um, I, one couldn't find a, a finer group of people to work with. They've been very supportive to these ideas which others might have thought were a bit avant-garde. Mm -hmm. And that's been a pleasure. We're telling other of our clients that uh, of the fun we're having in Kalamazoo and trying to encourage them to also be bold. Mm -hmm and um, we appreciate the, the opportunity to have done some of these things first in Kalamazoo so that these other clients with, with, um, who are less bold won't feel like they're breaking new ground. Mm -hmm. Not everyone wants to break new ground, and I think um, the people here in Kalamazoo have an appetite for that.